This is a topic that has driven everything I have ever posted online, and the reason why I began posting in the first place at almost 50. I've always been a very private person and didn't want to share, maybe insecure, maybe nervous, all of those things, right? It's hard to put yourself out in this world, especially when you're older, I think. In some ways, it's easier because you care less, but it's harder, right? Technology and all those things. But in the last couple of days have really crystallized even more what I believe is the core piece of healing and trauma from emotionally unsafe parents and what I believe we have to most understand about our childhoods in order to heal. There are so many things to heal, but I really believe this, and here's why. First of all, um, it's been a rough week. I've had some medical things that are reemerging that I'm not thrilled about, which I, it may affect how I show up here, and I will share those with you. Not permanently, just a little bit. I'm also getting a cold, so I'm not feeling my best. But I just felt like I couldn't wait anymore to share this. And it was really crystallized, as I was saying, by two things I saw this week. Actually, three. The first one is that I am about to start. I've literally, I keep saying this, but I'm, I keep fine tuning my eggshell parents, how to heal from eggshell parents course. So I build the workbook and all the exercises, and then I shoot the videos because I kind of know the topic so well. That helps me kind of stay on track. So I'm at the point where I'm about to start making videos, even though I'm not feeling well. So we'll see how that goes this weekend. But that's been really heavy in my mind. Like I'm thinking about it all of the time for many reasons. Then I saw two TikToks this week. And if you'll just bear with me briefly, I want to share the stories with you. The first one is a creator that is a mom to older children. And she shares really vulnerably that at some point not that long ago, one of her older adult children said, Mom, if you don't knock it off, this stuff that you do, we're going to cut you out. Like, you are not welcome to be in our lives. And initially, I think she was shocked and, you know, thought like, what do you mean? Like, I did, I gave everything to you. I gave you so much more than my parents gave me. I volunteered. I drove to school. I, I did all the things. And then she realized, because she decided to go to therapy, that it was her unhealed trauma that was the problem. And I'm guessing what we're talking about with her is what I'm going to discuss today, that this piece I'm going to talk about is the heart of where the problems were in the relationship. I'll come back. Number two, this morning I was watching TikTok and I saw a creator who was stitching another creator, and it's not someone I normally follow, but I really was so moved by it, it made me tear up. It was a mom talking about how her parents had been, you know, emotionally dysregulated, yelled and screamed a lot. That was just the kind of MO in their house. And at some point, she's a mom. She's got three kids. It's been a very long day. Her spouse is gone. She's been on her own. She's struggling a lot. You know, it's that end of the day where you're just so tired. You have your window of tolerance is like this. And she kind of lost it. And I guess she was like yelling at one of her youngest children who was cowering in the corner. And one of her other children jumped in front of his mom and this child and said, stop, mom. Can't you see she's scared of you? And the creator was saying that in that moment, she realized, that, oh my God, I'm doing what my parents did. And I, I don't know the rest of the story because it was that's kind of where it ended. I'm assuming that her content is about, at least in part, or that, that part of it, changing parenting. And it just hit me that this piece of walking on eggshells, and I want to read it to you because I wrote it down and it's kind of, it's going to sound like a lot of words, but I'm going to explain it. To me, in addition to all the other pieces, this one piece I think is the most important. Number one, it is to understand that in every child's home, the parents, the caregivers, mood and mind determine everything. It sets the tone for relationships, for safety, for emotions, for sense of self, for everything, okay? In every home. But in homes where the parents have chronic and significant dysregulation, and I'm talking about parents who yell and scream and rage, parents who are more covert in their sort of like anger, but they're just moody and, you know, seething or just punishing. So it can be from overt to covert mood, negative mood especially, but it could be crying, anger, sadness, fear. It's all of those feelings 
happiness affects the home too, right? But we're talking today about the impact of the trauma of that negative mood. So when you have a parent, what matters most in our homes is how our parents handled their own dysregulation in front of us and what they expected us to do about it and how they responded to our dysregulation that I believe is the heart of what I call interpersonal chronic hypervigilance. And there are many pieces of hypervigilance, right? There's emotional, behavioral, physical, and all of those are presumed to go with this. But I really want to focus on this piece. Of course, emotions are part of it. Your nervous system, that's what we're talking about, right? But what I want you to get is that if you close your eyes and think about what kind of mood and mine, did one or both or any of my caregivers more chronically have often than not? And how did they expect me to respond to that? Meaning, did they expect me through enmeshment to help them manage their big feelings, to be the best friend and listen to all their adult stories and pains and wounds? Did they shut me out? Did they scream at me and say, go to your room and not talk to me for hours? How did they respond to me witnessing their dysregulation, and what was that dysregulation story about? And then, how did they respond as uh, to me as a child with my dysregulation, okay? So, for example, if the parent is raging and screaming and then starts saying, it's all your fault and you're the reason why I'm yelling, and if you didn't just do this one thing, I wouldn't be screaming, we're getting blamed, right? Maybe later they feel bad, maybe they apologize or they act like it didn't happen, or they start giving us something extra or whatever it is, or they ask us to talk about their big feelings and be a listener. Now they're pulling us in. They're expecting us to make it okay and regulate them. And or how do they respond to us even in that moment? Let's say we start crying. Does that make them more angry? What happens? Or just our general dysregulation, what do they do? For example, I've talked about both my parents being very, what I call, eggshell both of them having really significant aspects of what would be called narcissistic, borderline, immature responses to emotions for different reasons. Some trauma-related, I believe, and some not. But the point is, not able to manage those things, right? So you become, like, you're, you're always scanning for that. When is that going to change? That's the hypervigilant piece. The second thing was, I cried a lot as a kid. And I would have like those in my bed, sobbing, wailing, crying episodes where I was so upset. And multiple times, my mom would, that would trigger her so much. I don't even know what I had done. I'm an only child. Like, I don't, you know, I think I was, I think my emotions were a lot for her. But she would, I have a couple stories where she would yank me out of my bed and physically punish me for crying again and again and again. So what did I learn about? big feelings from her and my dad and my own, that they were dangerous, that they were somehow my fault, that I had to pretend like they were okay because the next day they were fine and loving and silly and everything was great, to disregard my own pain, to avoid conflict, the list goes on and on. And I discuss a lot of that in my course because the the fallout from this is huge. But this is the core piece I want to share that I just felt so moved by. It's like, this is the essence of hypervigilance and of walking on eggshells. And the reason why I like that term, eggshells, is because if I say, did you have a parent that you had to walk on eggshells or a caregiver or siblings? You know exactly what I mean. You know what I mean in your body. You know what I mean in the story. You know how all of that affects you probably now, right? Your sensitivity or not to people's big feelings. So this is the core. How the parent's dysregulation plays out in front of you chronically what you're expected to do or not for them, how they respond to you, and how they respond to your dysregulation, I fully believe is the biggest piece we have to understand and work on. And so here are the symptoms, okay? Number one, overreading any negativity, any emotional shifting as threat, as a a change that needs to be attended to in some way. So either you're supposed to help them manage it, you're supposed to run away from it, but whatever it is, it's like you're, you have a sensor, and that sensor is highly sensitive to any shifts in mood, particularly more what we call negative feelings, crying, anger, things like that. And you can't turn it off, even when you don't want to. It's triggering, and you're always on. Number two, being very sensitive to any perceived threats or ideas or just real or imagined 
experiences of rejection. So it, like, it always feels like you are very sensitive and you take things very close to heart because of the way they didn't manage their dysregulation or they couldn't manage or were triggered by yours. Everything feels very intense and very personal. And the pipeline, I call the mood or mind reading pipeline of a parent to self-blame is direct, right? Let's say that again. The mood, I call the mood ring or the mood reading pipeline. Remember those mood rings? You put them on, it would like tell you what mood you're in. You have to have a story. So mommy is mad. Why is mommy mad? What is my job? What do I do? Oh, it's my job. It's my fault. If I just hadn't left my shoes in the car, if I'd eaten my dinner faster, if I had made her happier, whatever it is, it's my fault. That's that chronic shame and blame. That's the cowering and that story in the beginning, right? Again and again and again. Everything feels very personal. Number three, over-focusing the way you do this is on people's verbal and nonverbal communication. So even when you don't want to have it happening, that sensor is reading everything. Did they just say something and their lip quivered? I've talked about in therapy when a client's eyes will start to like twitch here. I can tell they're about to cry. I think a lot of therapists are raised in homes like this where we had, for whatever reason, to be highly attentive to our caregiver's mood. And then if you have this combination of interest in people and all of that, in the, in the best way, it transfers to, to being a good therapist if you're doing your own work. In the worst way, it's another problem, I think. It's a boundary violation, so I'm not going to get into that. But like the point is, I think when you've been trained to be that kind of reader, which all kids are, it's just that in very chaotic eggshell homes and or moody, even quiet, silent treatment homes, you have to be very hypervigilant to mood shifts, right? Okay, so... So that you can't turn off. Maybe you're at a restaurant. Maybe it's someone else. Doesn't matter. It's in your body. You can feel it. Number four, as a result of all this, because people are the trigger, people require reading, you often choose to be alone. This is the big thing I think around complex trauma and isolating is in large part, there's always all these pieces happening. But one of them is that in your body and mind, you cannot shut off the mood reading, the mind reading. And then you feel, as a result of your childhood, some kind of way about it, that big feelings are bad, that it's your job to fix, that you should not feel that, that you should numb it, whatever it is, right? So you avoid things. You spend a lot of time alone because that is the only time you feel safe. And I've said this in many videos, I think a lot of people that have avoidant attachment Many of them actually had eggshell kind of parents or punishing parents in that way, that moody kind, but they avoid any big emotions at all costs. So they've leaned more into the avoidant pattern, but oftentimes they have a significant anxiety around intense emotion that they're avoiding, and that is the only time they feel safe. So it's not just vulnerability and we're getting close, it's the risk of being vulnerable to someone else's emotions in your presence that you can't, that you don't want to ever have to do again. The next one is as a result of that, being so depleted by social dynamics that it takes you a lot of recovery time. Now, of course, as I've said, alongside the shaping and neurodivergence of trauma, autism, ADHD, if you already have that hyperdynamic around social events and all of that, it's going to make it that much more significant. I think there's a huge overlap for parents who are eggshell type, narcissistic, maybe they're autistic, ADHD, undiagnosed, untreated, and those who we know are autistic, who are neurodivergent, whatever, ADHD, like what a terrible combination that is in many ways, right? Your hyper, oh, your nervous system is already elevated, and now you have to be even more responsive. That's a different video, but I think important. The next one is chronic relational issues everywhere, work, home, friends. Even if you don't experience it and you're like silently beefing with someone because you're low-key or high-key wounded by them, you make meaning out of every mood shift. So let's say your partner is relatively securely attached, but you're so sensitive that you're like, are you okay, babe? What's wrong, babe? Are you good? Are you good? And they're like, I'm fine. Stop asking me, right? You make, you're always looking to make meaning. That mood reading is so so much a part of who you are. And it can cause conflict because you create and you're actually looking for, and the research shows, when you've had these kind of childhoods with depressed, negative, whatever parents, you're so hyper attuned to that, that you might be creating it where it doesn't exist, or at least the lenses with which you interpret things are colored by that flavor of whatever that trauma is. And so you see that more or before or in place of anything else. And then the last few things are, of course, that this can all manifest in how you are generally socially, fears of rejection and 
the sensitivity to things, right? It's just like all of that makes it feel like it's too much, especially because you can't turn it off, all of that mood reading and, and the core of it being something wrong with you right? So that makes it, oh, you went to this party, you said the dumb thing. Oh, you gave a speech in class and how embarrassing. Like, it's just, you're so harsh on yourself because that pipeline, you were watching the students in the class, they didn't laugh at your joke. So they hate you, right? Whatever it is, or they think you suck. I mean, that's just where we can go sometimes. And then lastly, feeling like this is the core of the mood reading pipeline is that anyone shifts in the negative direction means that you did something wrong, you're in trouble, you're not good enough, you're not lovable, and it's your job, potentially, depending upon how your parent responded, to fawn, to people please, to manage their emotions, whatever it is, it always comes back to you. And the last thing I'll say is at the core, you know, for all of these, if emotions, if big feelings weren't managed well in the parent or the parent towards you, what do you think your belief is about big feelings in general? So understanding the role that your parents' mood and mind has played in your story, I believe, is the heart of these pieces, right? Now, lots of other factors can be involved. It is not only this. But my point is that I think that nothing influences us and impacts us more because that's the heart of attachment, right, of, of safety. Was it generally emotionally safe and responsive, secure? Was it unpredictable, inconsistent, anxious? Was it uh, a rejection of attempts to have bid for closeness? The point is, it is that environment alongside, of course, your own genetics, your own temperament, sensitivities, things like that. But I think that if you look at understanding how your parent dealt with their own dysregulation and yours chronically, not intermittently, we all have moments where we lose it, our kids lose it. And yeah, while some single events can be like PTSD traumatic, because let's say a parent does some horrible things once or twice in your childhood, that's going to impact you. But every, you know, most parents are going to have their days. But I really do think that this whole dynamic has become physical uh, discipline has been replaced by a lot of yelling and screaming for a lot of reasons. Our lack of support, our being alone, our lack of um, help, you know, our, our mental health, the world we live in, the, the stress of living in the, in the world. Like, it's not just one thing, but it is a thing you have to be mindfully aware of if you don't want to repeat it. Because most of us are triggered all day, every day in some way, right? Some of us, some of us a lot more than others, but it's how you manage that and how you respond. The last thing I'll say is, I'm going to, this is also in my course, but I always share this, um, is that skills like DBT skills, dialectical behavior therapy, Uh, I've listed, I'll I'll list a book I love down below, a workbook, where you focus on mindfulness and distress tolerance and emotion regulation skills. I have a whole section on that in my course too, because that's the thing. What do you do when you feel those big feelings, especially if you don't want to yell? People will often post when I make TikToks on eggshell parents and they'll say, I think I'm an eggshell parent. What do I do? Right? So I have a whole thing on yelling. I think I already said that, but I think it's really important. And um, it's not to say that, like I said, um, we have to be anywhere near perfect or, or anything like that. No one is constantly emotionally regulated or, or anywhere close. But it, I believe that that factor is probably one of the most significant factors because that connects to everything, right? Sense of self, safety, emotions, relationships. What does it mean to deal with feelings as it relates to another person? And what is my role or job in all of that? So that's it. Thank you for being here. Please stay safe and well. I hope you enjoy this Super Bowl weekend and I will see you soon. Take care.